So let's jump into a not so quick refresher. Because everybody here has the prereqs, right? <coughs> Negative numbers, two's complement. Anybody explain that? Negative numbers. How are negative numbers represented in memory? I'll give you a hint. That's it, right there. Two's complement. Can anyone describe to me what two's complement is? Uh, yes, Corey. Negative one is F F F F F F F F, and you count backwards from that. Okay. Flip all the bits, then add one. Yeah, that's a yeah, that's a good way to think about it. Of the positive number, yeah. So negative one is so. If you take a look at the bits for 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 one, it's just the the one bit. It's that flip all of the bits in there um, and add one. You end up having okay f f f f f f f e plus one f f. So that's negative one. Two, same idea. You you flip the bits, add one. That's how it's stored in memory. So that's good to know. NDNS. What is NDNS? By order in memory. Okay, by order in memory, yeah. What is network by order? Does anybody know that one? <laughs> it's big idea. Yeah. 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 Oh. Function return values. So in assembly language, this this is a. It all depends on the compiler, but in general, um, function return value is typically stored where. Yeah. What was that? EAX, which is a, to make sure everybody understands, what is EAX? Yeah, yeah, it's a register. Calling convention. Um, oh, wait, function values. I'm quite sure what I meant by that. Function Register. values are stored. Hmm? Register. I think I was, I think that was supposed to say function um, arguments. Function arguments are stored where? How many people think they're stored in registers? How many people think they're stored on the stack? It's kind of like in memory, but that. <laughs> <laughs> you push the address on somewhere on the computer. <laughs> so it, it all it, they are they are they're so in the computer. On the stack. Um, they are. It's it depends. They're in the computer. Uh, it depends on the compiler. Um, this gets into the the next one, calling conventions. You can have um, um, so for things like Visual Studio, you have the, the arguments are pushed onto the stack, um, except when we start getting into uh, object-oriented, which you'll see later on in the course, uh, for Blanking on, I think GCC. No, 
I'm blanking on what um, who uses fast call. Does anybody know? Uh, oh yeah, I had heard that 64-bit. Thank you, Corey. I had heard that. Um, haven't looked into this because I, I don't usually deal with 64-bit. But I had heard that on the MD64, the um, standard for Visual Studio now is to use the uh, fast call since they have more registers on the AMD64. Fast call being where the first, I want to say, four arguments are stored in registers. Anything more than that is pushed onto the stack. So calling conventions, which we kind of got into, you got your your calling conventions that say, okay, I want to push stuff onto the stack. Um, you got your calling conventions that say, I want to uh, put the arguments into registers. Uh, there is also, well, can anybody else tell me what what other kinds of uh, expectations there are for the different calling conventions? Yeah. 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 So, like cleaning up of the stack. Anybody know what I mean when I say cleaning up the stack? So caller and callee. Right. So caller versus callee. So caller cleanup is the if I'm pushing stuff onto arguments onto the stack for a function, whose job is it is to pop those off of the stack after the function? returns or when the function returns. Is it the function that's being called pops them off the stack before it returns? Or is it the the function that is doing the calling after the call returns, then you pop the arguments off the stack? And that is is dependent on the compiler. For the Visual Studio stuff that we're going to be working with, it's going to be call the Clean up. So at the end, of course. Only call they clean up for certain library files and otherwise just caller. I mean, I got that wrong, but like if you call like a window DLL function, I thought that it was callee cleanup. So I thought that if you called another function within your own code, it was caller. This next one I put on there because I personally always forget this, but it's, it's kind of good to know. When you see the compare instruction, think of it like a, a subtract, but you're not actually storing the result. Test, it's like an and, but you're not storing the result. And you can uh, see what uh, flags get said based off of that. Just something to remember. XOR, can anybody tell me what does XOR do? Not in the back. Exclusive war. Okay. That does stand for exclusive war. <laughs> now, what does it do? Uh, it says if and only if uh, all the bits, and then sort of the result. Is the way I have it. If and only if. Only if. I've never heard it worded like that. Can you word it differently? If it's the same, so if you have two different bytes, you're XORing and you're comparing the bits when they're the same, it's zero, and when it's different, it's one. XOR is important to remember when you're looking at um, different encoding algorithms. Uh, encryption, for instance. Yes, question? I just want to say you can also think of it as a carryless addition. Yeah, you can think of it as a carryless addition. It's like another way to think about it. 
um, encryption. We'll use XOR, simple obfuscations like you see with malware. We'll use XOR. So that's it's good to understand what that is doing. Um, reading the Intel manuals. Just FYI, if you don't know something, you're going to come across an instruction that you don't know when you're reverse engineering. I do all the time, and I've been doing this for a while. Um, the Intel manuals are a really good resource. Uh, I included a zip of not the most recent, but but ones from a few years ago in my transfer folder. Uh, with an internet connected system, it's just as easy to actually go to the Googles and type in the instruction and uh, get the syntax there. Um, the Intel manuals are really detailed though and they, they will tell you exactly what is going on um, to a level that just is fabulous. So I highly recommend checking those out if you really need to get into the nitty gritty of you know what exactly is this doing, not just a you know the move is moving this to that, but the different um, types of move, what are the flags that get changed. Uh, Intel manuals are really good for that. Um, effects of compiler options. So that one I just wanted to make sure everybody understands that. Compiler, the compilers are what turns the, what you write the code into the assembly or the, the, the byte code that uh, the computer can read. Uh, different options that you can give to the compiler, you can tell it to optimize for space or to optimize um, uh, for, well, uh, for the, to optimize for size of the binary or optimize for uh, memory utilization. They have lots of different optimization features. Each of these things will make you get a different um, interpretation of what you coded up in your language to the bytecode. Um, so you can, this matters from a, so my big example is malware analysis. Um, a lot of people say, okay, what's the MD5 of that? to say I got something you know the same as, as what you got. But if you're talking how easy it is to change that MD5, all the person needs to do is change a small option when they go to compile. Don't even have to change a single thing with the code that they wrote up. And I have a very different looking binary. So there's something to be aware of. Disassembling. So there are, we'll, we'll tackle that in a second, one under disassembling. There are two basic algorithms for a disassembler. Does anybody know what those are? The, when I say two different algorithms, I mean when it, it reads through a, a, basically a blob of data that it thinks is instructions, how does it say, okay, these ones are instructions and this is the, the order that it's gonna show you in and these are how I identify the, the blocks and the functions. Let me go to, to if anybody online first. <laughs> anybody online? Okay, the, 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 pick the entry point and explore all the control flow options. So that is, that is one that's called recursive traversal. Yeah. No? No, I'm shaking my head. What? You want the other one you want? 
Yeah, well, let me explain. So recursive traversal, what Corey was saying, uh, where you pick the entry point and explore all the controllable options. You start at, uh, you start somewhere for a PE file. It's This is where the entry point is. And you go, okay, uh, the bytes here, uh, if, if the, that was an instruction, this is the instruction that I think it is. And then if it is some kind of um, jump, uh, or, or conditional jump, then I will I will follow that um, and then decode the bytes from there and, and basically do a um, if I see a jump or a conditional jump, follow that. If it's conditional, then then it will also uh, follow the next instructions down. So this is one way that um, you can kind of jump over um, or get around garbage code or data in between your instructions. The other way of doing it just goes down and um, reads kind of line for line. Okay, this is an instruction. This is an instruction. This is an instruction, and it interprets it um, each each next uh, set of bytes as instructions uh, without um, any awareness of or, or taking into consideration exactly what those instructions are, rather uh, other than the you know length of the instruction based off of the bytes. Um, actually, that's that's something worth saying as well. Yeah, I don't get into it. Um, the whole reason that that you have the uh, byte lengths or varying byte lengths for instructions, we're talking the uh, x86 architecture is a uh, CISC architecture versus something like. Um, I don't know, MIPS, I think, would be like a risk architecture, or the, um, I think the, the what's on your phones, um, that ARM, thank you, is, uh, that CPU is a risk architecture. Now, the risk architectures use fixed instruction lengths. So every single instruction is a certain number of, of bytes, whereas for the CISC, CISC the x86, you have varying number of bytes for your instructions. So these were the last two on here, just two things that I want to keep in mind. Um, pretty sure I'll, I'll bring it up later on in the notes uh, when you when I expect you to see it. But local variables for functions. Uh, Ida is going to show you as EBP plus some um, variable name that it just comes up with. And you'll see that when we get into Ida. For array references, it's going to look like a, a base plus index times scale plus offset. Okay. Talk about P files. P files, P file, Windows executable, like any other file format, it's got a header that says this is the file type. Does anybody know the first two bytes in the PE file? MZ is a, a quick way to say I have a, uh, well, I have a executable here. It's not necessarily a PE file. There's, there's other parts to it. Um, the specification is online. You can, you can find out exactly what it is. We're going to be using a tool there, CFF Explorer, that will actually parse the headers of a PE file. And we load it up in there. It'll show you all the nitty gritty detail of, yes, this is a PE file. Oh, this is a DLL because the specific bit within the header is set to say this is a DLL, not just because it has .dll in the file name. Um, section names. So, so files are broken up into sections. Anybody give me some of the, I'll go online for this one first, some of the uh, um, common section names for a PE file, folks online. Yep, dot text. Anyone other than Corey online? Mm -hmm. 
data, yeah. Okay, so we got text and data. Anybody? Our data. Our data. I something, yep. I data. Sorry. Relock, yep. So so do these do these section names mean anything? Mm. Yeah. From a from the from the operating system executing the file. Does the operating system care what the names of the sections are? No. No, it doesn't. Uh, the, the section names are hints put in by the compiler to say, hey, this is, you know, this is the code section, and this is where your your data section is, and this is where your read-only data is, and to make it easier to analyze and, and see see what's going on um, when you start taking a look at things like malware that. Uh, that doesn't want you to know what's going on, they could mess those up. They can call the the R, what is really the read-only data section dot text, and the operating system doesn't care that it's called dot text, that it's named that. Or they could name it something completely else, like dot re is awesome. You know, it, it, the operating system just doesn't care. Algorithms. I was gonna gonna ask for some before I showed that. So for for algorithms, when we talk about algorithms or or program flow, what are some some of your common program flow uh, uh, things in in like languages? Like like I'll I'll start it off. You know, do while loops. Go to. Go to. Hey, yeah. Conditional statements. The for. Hmm? For loops. For loops. That's a good one. I like for loops. Assignments and arithmetic. What was that? Assignments and arithmetic. Assignments and arithmetic, yes. Um, in terms of conditionals, what are a couple of examples of conditionals? Statements. Yep. Case statements. If statements. Else. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. Else. Else if. Um. They. That would be part of. Of. Yeah. So that would be part of kind of a implementation of a algorithm. So, so here, let me expand this. So assignment, arithmetic, conditionals, loops, stuff like recursion, searching, where you would, would implement a, some kind of searching algorithm using one or more functions, selecting, sorting, and, and all sorts of stuff under there. Um, so these are the, in this class, um, we're going to be looking at mainly, mainly this stuff, conditionals, loops, recursion. Okay, data types and structures. Let's, let's, let's start online for this one. Online, can you give me an example of some data types? Car in double. Yep, those are some data types already. Right. Flow, yeah. So these are things you typically see in well C struct, yeah. Heap stack, yeah. Those are our data structures. 
So the car and double flow, you'll see those in languages like C, C++, Java that are strongly typed, meaning that you have to explicitly say, hey, this variable that I'm using is an int, or this variable that I'm using is, is a float, or a double, or a car, or a car star. Um, pointers, there you go, thank you. So, so you don't see those in, uh, or, or rather you see the, the higher kind of level things and not so much those in weak type languages like Python, where you don't have, when you declare a variable, you don't have to say, hey, this is an integer, and I'm only going to store numbers in here. Um, you have a variable, and you can have it basically store whatever you want or point to whatever you want. Um, but you do get things like um, uh, stacks, um, structures, um, queues, See what does anybody here in the uh, classroom have anything else to add? Graphs are structured. Graphs, yep. Graphs are structured. Let's see what I had. In double float car pointer. Global versus local. Array. String struct like this. Okay. Class. Classes and objects, all classes. Iterators. So global versus local. What? Uh, anybody tell me what's a what's a global variable versus a local variable? What does that mean? Um, global is just initiated outside of the scope, so um, like basically, it would be like a variable that. So global is is global for the program. Local is local for the particular function. <coughs> what does that mean in terms of when you're taking a look at it in assembly code? What's how is a global variable going to look different than a local variable? Anybody online? Global has memory location, local is just on the stack. Yeah, if we're if we're not talking about dynamic allocating memory, like your, your malloc or your news, we're just talking straight, you know, declaring a, a variable in your code, the globals are going to be in memory, and your locals will be on the stack or in a register if if you're doing it that way. If the compiler's doing it that way. Let's see what else. Linked list. Can anybody tell me what a linked list is? Describe to me what a linked list is. It's data structure. It is a data structure. another thing. <clears throat> yeah, the, the basic idea of the linked list is you have a object that, um, or it could be a, a structure, a, a simple struct in C uh, that has any number of, of um, members, but one of them has to be a pointer to the next item within the list. And so you know what the end of the list is when that uh, you reach a object where that pointer is null. It's not pointing to, to any other object. <clears throat> so it's a basic data structure concept that can be used for implementing various things, stacks, keys, 